Beautiful. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Dalu, uh, for a professor at the Kinshasa School of Public Health, who is going to um, share his thoughts and experience with COVID-19 in the DRC. Dr. Dalu and I have been working together for several years in Congo. We're really very lucky to have him as part of our research team. Uh, and so I um, am really, really glad to be able to introduce him. Dr. Dalu, you might want to actually, before you get started on the presentation, maybe just share a little bit about yourself and your background, if you don't mind. Um, because I actually, I didn't get a, I, I just realized I actually don't have a bio to read. Um, so why don't you just, just briefly share just, you know, your, your background, your training, and um, then we can get started with the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Annie. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my uh, experience on the COVID in DRC with uh, the team. First of all, I would like to apologize for my poor English. So as you can notice, I'm a French speaking guy. So I'm, I, I'm trying to make myself understood in English. So I would like to apologize first for that. Your English uh, is beautiful. Really? Basically, uh, uh, my background is a medical doctor. And uh, I have... Um, worked for many many years in uh, researchers related to malaria hiv and other infectious diseases and uh, i've been uh, assistant to ksph since uh, 2010 and i've got my phd in um, uh, at the university of uh, at the Catholic University of Lovanium in Belgium, and my research was based on the the prevention of uh, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I've been working with uh, the UCLA DRC research program for now two years and a half, and we have been together doing enough studies and today this morning we also have uh, disseminated one of our research and we, maybe we will have the chance to talk about during this talk uh, professor Anya, i think this is enough for, about myself it's perfect so thank you so much yeah. for sharing your background and yeah so now let's get started thank you so much Um, do you, are you sharing your slides or uh, Advar, is somebody else putting the slides up for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me know if you're not able to share. Oh, there we go. Okay, now we can see your screen. Yeah, okay. So, as you know, here in DRC, we are now, it, it's 9 p.m., so we have been, uh, we, we had a very long day. Uh, what I would like to share today is uh, I, have, I only have a few slides, but I will talk more than uh, these sli this few slides. I will focus my talk on the impact of doing research in DRC, how COVID-19, how COVID-19 outbreak have impacted the way we are doing researchers in DRC. As you know, DRC is uh, located in the middle, in the central part of uh, Africa with uh, nine borders country. 
In fact, the DRC is a, a very huge country, but its population is still young, with uh, less than 50% of uh, the population being less than uh, 70 years. And 46% of uh, the population is less than 40 years. However, DRC have uh, a very high mortality rate, which is uh, WHO assess this. According to WHO estimate, the, this mortality, maternal mortality rate, rate is about uh, 4,930 days. Um, so, Dalu, yes. really quickly, I'm sorry to cut you off. Can you? Yeah, I was saying that the population is a uh, majority young, and the evolution of uh, the pandemic outbreak in DRC, DRC has uh, noticed the, its first case of uh, COVID-19 in March 2020. That was uh, a case from, uh, from Paris. In fact, the origin of uh, these guys was, uh, first of all, it was assessed to be and the uh, I would like to. I would like you to see this graph. So, uh, yeah, I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm still waiting for it. I don't know if it's my email already, or. Didn't he already send the slides at some point? Sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Please. I'm trying to send again. Hold on. Okay, I can go ahead with that slide. But Dalu, since you are able to share your screen, maybe if we just walk you through how to... Um... Yeah, I'll try again. There you go. Can you see my, yep. my screen? Yes, now we can. Okay. There you go. So, okay, so this is... This is the, the cumulative number of cases in DRC as per November 26 uh, from uh, the situational reports that uh, the Ministry of Health usually shared. So this one I just received is this evening showing in red, you can see the trend of uh, cumulative cases since the first case appeared in in, in March 10th. So here you can see the first wave of COVID-19 cases in DRC, and then the second wave and the, 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 the third one. And, and it seems like uh, we are approaching the fourth wave, which is um, the government informed about the fourth wave by uh, December of uh, this year. But interestingly, during this period, during the first wave, that is um, in the middle of uh, April, the end of March, the end of March till the uh, the, the middle of uh, July, the government took a number of uh, restrictive measures to prevent the spread of, spread out of uh, the outbreak. And among these measures, there were lockdown, there were curfew, the government restricted public manifestation. And I will come back to talk about this period because uh, we were having a study 
two or three studies during this period, and I will share what we did and how we how this uh, COVID uh, restriction measure impacted our study in uh, DRC. And the case fatality rate in DRC is still very, very low, which is uh, less than 20,000 uh, cases. This is the cases by different provinces of DRC. The DRC has uh, 26 provinces, and mainly you can see that most of the cases appear in Kinshasa, which is here. We have uh, also Bakongo and uh, North Kivu, uh, Okatanga. So Kinshasa is uh, the biggest part of the country where there is more case of uh, COVID-19. This is the vaccination coverage. As you can see, the country started vaccination in April 2000, 2021, but from April up to, up to now, we have uh, less than 1% of population uh, vaccinated. And the number of those, the daily number of those administered per 100%, per 100 people is less, by far less than one, one dose per 100 people a day, which means we have uh, a very, very low Vaccine, vaccine uptake and a very, very high low of very high rate of uh, vaccine hesitancy. So this is as a brief overview of uh, the situation of the COVID-19 in DRC. So how did the COVID-19 affect the researchers in DRC? I will talk about three studies, three main studies, vigilance study that we, the second one is uh, the COVID-19 healthcare worker, a court of healthcare, and the last one is uh, the COVID remote. So the first study, which is uh, the pharmacovigilance study, this study aimed at evaluating the capacity of a uh, health facility in DRC to do a pharma. or the follow-up or the assessing the prevalence of uh, maternal birth outcome and maternal vaccination in DRC. We were conducting this study in 10 facilities that were around the book, that were sampled here in Kinshasa. And the study had two parts. The first part is a retrospective and the second one is a prospective. So the study began in 2019, before the COVID-19 start. So we, we were con collecting that data in health facility using birth records and prenatal care records. To have a, a facility, there were one data collector that was who was assigned to collect data in this facility. So that was, this was a, a facility-based study, and uh, the, the data collector used to go in the study in the facility every day. We started data collector 
in collecting data from July, August, September, October, November 2019. I would like to apologize because of these, some of my slides are in French, so I will try to translate them during my presentation. And then in March 2020, we have uh, the first case of COVID-19. Before this case, we used to collect data in health facility. Data collector used to go to the facility every day to collect data. And then the COVID-19 case appear in March and the government apply many restrictions and many log lockdown. So we were not able to collect data in health facility anymore. And to protect our data collectors also, we could not send them out during this period. So what we did during this time was to take as much as possible pictures of uh, birth records uh, of uh, prenatal prenatal records. So data took these uh, these pictures and they collecting data from their home. That went from March to August. During this four month, there were during this four month data collector were working from work from home because they there were, there were many restrictions from the government and we didn't want to expose our data collector to eventual case of uh, COVID-19. So this is the first impact that we had in our study because uh, it was unusual for us to have a picture of a birth record and to have a data collector filling form from their home. So this was uh, our first time to do this. And um, we had to be flexible to, uh, to adapt to the case of uh, COVID-19. And then in August, due to decrease, of, decrease in number of uh, cases, the government relaxes, relaxed the COVID restriction, restriction. And then we resume with uh, having data collector going to the health facility because this was uh, uh, the prospective uh, stage of the study and data collector had to interview pregnant women in, in the facility. But I have to mention here that we, we were very, very flexible in a sense that when the COVID-19 case appear here, in our study, we didn't have a question about COVID-19. We didn't have uh, any module about COVID-19. Then we add, at this point, we add some question related to COVID-19. For example, we, we add some question related to the observation of pregnant women who are coming to the health facility. Are they wearing face masks? Do they wear face masks correctly? Because of, since the beginning of the, the pandemic up to that time, there were no studies that informed about the adherence to COVID-19 preventive measure among pregnant women. So we added this module in this study to collect those data. And I have, I have to mention that before this, uh, we previously with uh, some of uh, some colleagues from KSPH, we published a paper, a paper in which we assess the adherence of uh, the general population to preventive measure of COVID-19. So there were a lack of data regarding pregnant women. So that is why we added this component here. And uh, I have to tell you that this uh, paper is uh, ready to be sub submitted for publication in the few coming days. And on that paper, we, we have worked with uh, 
Adva, with Pat, with Nicole, and uh, Professor Annie, and the other member of, uh, of the team. So, in the pharmacovigilance study, as I said, we were collecting data re regarding the birth outcome, the seven birth outcomes such as neonatal invasive blood infection, neonatal death, congenital macrocephaly, low birth weight, preterm birth, small for gestational age, and stillbirth. And as you can see on the right here in, on, in these pictures, this is in one of uh, the 10 facilities. of them physician or nurses. And these are birth recorded. So as you can see, these are and once they have picture, They can go working from their home. These birth records is a very, very challenging because of the way that facility used to stock these uh, these records. So this was about the first study and the adaptation that we made due to COVID nineteen. First of all, the main one was. Uh, to adapt the way, to adapt the design of the study to, to, to comply with uh, the government restriction and, to, and most mainly to protect our data collectors and our team. And the good news was that uh, from the beginning of this study up, up to the end of this study, no member of uh, our team got COVID-19. So every day, everyone from them was protected and no one gets sick. And the, the second one, the second adaptation was uh, to add question or questionnaire related to COVID-19 based on the demand and based on the lack of information that we during that time regarding COVID-19, mainly uh, in pregnant women in DRC. And the second study is the uh, COVID-19 among healthcare workers. So in our pharmacovigilance study, we didn't have uh, a huge focus on COVID-19 in general population. We only focus on uh, pregnant women, asking some few questions about preg uh, to pregnant women, mainly about the preventive measure against COVID-19. So we designed another study in which we focus, we mainly focus on COVID-19, but this time, not only not at pregnant women, but we included healthcare workers in the study. This was uh, a one-year study, and before before COVID nineteen, we used to go to we used to conduct in-person interview. So we have uh, that we train data collector and we deploy them on the field to collect data using person-to-person -person interview. But during the pandemic period, this was not possible due to many restrictions. And then we introduced the data collection using phone call. So we called people by weekly, by phone, and uh, the team was the data collection team was based in Kinshasa. They were not traveling around different provinces of DRC, and they they were calling people by phone. And these health workers is uh, they are a cohort of people that participated in a previous study 
that uh, the, our program, the, the UCLA DRC program conducted in these four uh, provinces, Kinshasa, Kikwit, Beni, and, uh, and Bandaka. And we had more questions about COVID-19, the clinical manifestation and symptoms, occupation exposure, community exposure, and also we assess knowledge, attitude, and practice of uh, community health workers. And uh, this also, during this study, we also assess the vaccine hesitancy among community, among healthcare workers. It's, I apologize, just one minute. Excuse me, one minute. Sorry for that. I'm having this talk from home, so many disturbance from uh, the family. Sorry for that. So we, during this study, we assess vaccine hesitancy among, among healthcare workers because many studies before this one has assessed the COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy as uh, in many, in cross-sectional study. So they assess this as uh, a cross-sectional uh, event. But during this, uh, this, during this study that was uh, longitudinal one, we assess longitudinally COVID uh, vaccine hesitancy during COVID-19. And we saw that this vaccine hesitancy is not a statistic, a, a statistic, it's static, it's not static, 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 it's not static, it's a, a, a dynamic event that fluctuated across the time with a different, with a different event. Factor that can affect. For example, we saw that vaccination with uh, as was very high. It increased from that period, and then it fluctuated and came down with uh, the decrease of uh, COVID-19 cases in DRC. So this also is uh, a paper that uh, we are uh, we submitted and uh, that is uh, under review. And we work on this paper with uh, OMG. So <clears throat> OMG, feel, feel free to make any comments on that. So hey, the, last, <laughs> the last study, the last study is uh, a COVID remote. So we have a COVID-19 healthcare worker study, and then we have a COVID remote. The COVID remote study was designed based on uh, our experience with uh, the COVID-19 uh, healthcare worker study. So during this study, we only focus on uh, healthcare workers in four provinces, but we, we missed the general population. And uh, we didn't focus on uh, remote. In DRC, during, at the time that we were designing this study, there were many remote around COVID-19 vaccine. So people was uh, very, very hesitant vis-a-vis -vis to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So there was a need to collect data regarding uh, remotes around COVID-19 vaccine. This is why we designed this study to collect many remotes in general population and in, 
including healthcare workers, including community leaders, including religious leaders, public leaders, and uh, people with comorbidity and general population in the 26 provinces of, uh, of the country. And this also was, uh, this is an a, a ongoing study. This is uh, a phone call study. We are calling people by monthly, by monthly, by phone. And uh, as you can see, we are not doing in-person study because uh, our team is based in Kinshasa, which is the capital city of uh, DRC, and they are calling people from uh, different provinces. And in this study, we also include social, <clears throat> in addition to phone survey, we have included social listening approach using Grand 24 software to collect remorse in social, social media, mainly uh, Twitter and, uh, and Facebook, because uh, there are many, many remorse around COVID-19 vaccine in DRC. And uh, as you saw, the vaccine uptake is very, very low. So the, all these remotes contribute to the low uptake of uh, COVID-19 in DRC. And as you can see on this picture, there are, these are team, these are teams that we are collecting in the, on the social media, we are collecting different posts and organize them in different team and we publish this team weekly. And the most important thing that I would like to, out, to highlight here is that we are not conducting this research just for the sake of research. We have seen that there is a lack of uh, communication at the national level to promote COVID-19 vaccination. So the messages that were given in the communication were somehow not adapted to the expectation of people or to what people have in their minds. So from this study, as we are collecting remorse on the social media, as we are collecting also remorse through phone survey, we have uh, somehow helped the EPI program and the um, organization that are working in communication to tailor their communication to promote vaccine, vaccine uptake in DRC. So every week we share the weekly report, a weekly report with uh, all these organizations. And we also attend most of the meeting to share regularly our results and to share some of our recommendation. And this has raised many, a very, very high enthusiasm in uh, the community of uh, people who are fighting against COVID-19 in DRC. For example, at the, the national level, there is uh, a committee that they call in French uh, communication de risk. So in, in English, maybe this is a uh, uh, emergency communication. We're very, very impressed and their capacity mainly in social listening to collect different remorse in uh, social media to help or to tailor communication strategy. So these are some of remorse that we collected. For example, one of the remorse is that uh, there are dangerous side effects of COVID-19 or there are dangerous material in, vac in the vaccine that could be harmful to population, or uh, this one came, this one came almost every week that people think that the vaccine are used to st sterilize or cause harm to our population. You know, 
in DRC, the fertility rate is uh, very high. So people think that the vaccine is used as a contraceptive measure to sterilize people so they don't get more and more children. So all these remotes, we organize them in a sense that we share them with uh, the different, the, the, the API program and uh, the, the committee of uh, COVID-19, of fighting COVID-19 in, in DRC. So to, as a conclusion, I can say the COVID-19 has uh, impacted the way we are making researches in DRC in a sense that in DRC, we previously focused, we previously collect our data in by in-person contact, in-person interview. But since the COVID-19 came, we could, we could not continue doing in-person contact because of uh, all the restrictions. So we adapted the way we of uh, collecting data we, are, we use phone call instead of uh, in-person <clears throat> contact. And also we have, uh, the COVID-19 uh, somehow tried to, wrap, to uh, approach, to, re to make uh, researchers more closer, those who are work working in COVID-19 uh, area, mainly in communication area, are now focusing on how to tailor communication that can be more effective in having people in uh, increasing the demand of uh, the vaccine in, uh, in DRC. So, so this is what I wanted to share with, uh, with the team this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Annie. So back to you. If uh, we have, there is there are some questions, I'm uh, happy to to share with uh, the team. Terrific, Dalu. This is a really great presentation. It's so interesting, and it's so great just to see it all together in this, in this way. I, I I really I really do appreciate it. Um, I want to open up a question. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I was going to ask, did you, in, in any of these studies, did you notice any um, differences between rural or more urban areas? OK, if uh, your question is, uh, if we notice the difference, any difference between uh, urban and the rural area, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I have to say, yes, there is a, a very huge difference in the sense that we are collecting data basically, mainly uh, from uh, phone calls. You know, the phone call in urban area, it's somehow easy to find list of uh, call and to to found um, network. The phone network is um, somehow stable in urban area, but in a rural area, this is very tough. It is very, very tough to find. The, in this area, many people do not have a phone call, tel a telephone, and if they have phone, the network is uh, is not stable, so there are some places that uh, in uh, in a village they have uh, located a, a tree, a tree where people can find a network. So at some point, to get these people, they have to be at that tree. So this is the point uh, in the village that where people can find network. So if they are not in that area, you cannot reach them. But the, the good news is that we are calling people many times. 
So we are not only calling once, we are calling many times. So we have, uh, we increase the chance of uh, getting these people in uh, urban, in rural area. Thank you so much. I had a quick question. Um, hi, Dalu. Uh, really great presentation. Thanks for taking the time to, to meet with us. I know it's late for you. Um, I know that we haven't used tel like phone interviews a ton in our group, but is that common in general in the DRC, or is it really not common to use phone interviewing? Oh, Angie, that was a really good question. Dalu, did you hear? Can you repeat, please? I didn't hear it. Oh, yeah. Can you repeat? Sure. Um, I was wondering how common it is to use phone interviewing generally in the DRC, I guess prior to COVID-19. Sorry, Angie, can you repeat? Sorry, sorry for that. Can you repeat your question sure. once more? Yeah. Um, just how common is it generally in the DRC to use phone interviewing? I know we haven't used it a ton in our group, but prior to COVID, was it common to use phone interviews in research collection? Yeah, I have to say that it was not common to use a phone call to collect data. Uh, before we before we do this uh, phone call study, with uh, my colleague at KSPH, we had uh, a, an international study in which we decided to do an online survey. That was uh, an online survey. We designed an online questionnaire, and we share by WhatsApp the the link. We shared by WhatsApp in different in different group. We shared the link, so once the once any people anyone has uh, that link, he can access to the questionnaire and complete the fill the questionnaire and reply back. And the thing is, uh, when we did that, we only have uh, like uh, less than ten percent of uh, our expected sample size in the country. So. Before the COVID-19, we were not in DRC, we were not used to collect data from um, phone, phone call or online survey. So this is an adaptation that came mainly with uh, COVID-19 because uh, at some point there were restrictions with uh, travel. We could not travel around uh, around the country. So the only way <clears throat> to collect data was uh, to use phone call. So it's something new in, in DRC. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and you bring up a great point also about, you know, the difficulty of even those who have surmounted one barrier of having access to a phone often have to, you know, deal with a second barrier, which is connecting to the network, to the cellular network, um, which of course is, is much more difficult to do in a lot of rural areas that have, have worse um, satellite coverage. Yeah. Right. So that can so often the the phone interviews would introduce sort of an unnecessary selection bias um, into some of that research based on who has access to a phone and who has access to network. Um, and so yeah, for that reason, I think you've pointed out pretty clearly why why that causes a lot of restrictions in um, in public health surveillance and research in DRC. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. thinking about, because we had relative success, I would think, 
dollar with um, the healthcare workers. But I think that that's because there was already a relationship with those people and they all have access to phones. Um, I don't know if you like have thoughts on that because we had pretty good response rate and retention in that in that study. Yeah, of course. And, and I think uh, I think in the current study, in the, the general population study, we have uh, last week we had uh, eighty three percent of uh, follow up. So we could follow up. Uh, Eighty-three percent of uh, people, which is uh, the which is a very high response rate in uh, in a longitudinal study. So, I think people are getting more. Uh, they are they are now getting more habituated with uh, the the phone the phone call. Absolutely. And probably, you know, with the pandemic, that will only become more and more common. So it will it will likely become a more accepted form of research. Um, I would also guess, though, to Angie's point that some of the high success rate in following uh, these participants and in getting them to participate in the first place in the phone survey is that there has been a relationship established with them in a, in a previous cohort study where we were meeting in person. And so they know to expect phone calls uh, potentially from a certain phone number of a study team member um, and that sort of thing that, that really does help increase participation through phone survey. And then uh, there was a question from Skylar in the chat, Dalu. Uh, the question is, can you speak a little bit about the role? Oh. Yeah, the role of uh, social media. Oh, yeah, okay, you see it. COVID 19 misinformation in DRC, particularly specific group actually disseminating misinformation for political gain. Yeah. I have to say, yes, for, there, is, uh, there are many misinformation in uh, social media in DRC. You know, the context of uh, DRC is uh, is a little bit specific in a sense that we have to face with uh, uh, one side is political this political world and the other one is uh, the scientific world. So people do not understand how the government can ask people to use face masks to avoid being in uh, in crowded public places. But at the other side, we have uh, politicians doing all public activities with wearing masks, without uh, social distancing. So there are kind of a duality between uh, these, these two words. So whenever there is uh, this kind of uh, event, the social media is uh, the place where people, they are like, uh, you know, there are, the world is uh, split in two. There is Uh, one way to, in, of uh, the COVID-19 in, in, and uh, the other COVID exists in DRC. So whenever there is uh, this kind of a politician event, this guy who do not believe in the, in the COVID-19 in DRC, they come in the social media and say, if there is COVID-19 in DRC, why all these people who attended the social, the, the public event, none of them are affected and this is in contrast with a decrease in the number of, of cases. So all these um, promote misinformation in social, in social media. So there is, a, there is a, this misinformation in group. And we, from social media, uh, from a social listening approach, we have identified, we have identified a number of uh, 
of um, count a number of uh, groups that are spreading misinformation about the vaccination. And we have reported that to the, I, the IP program and uh, the National Committee of uh, uh, Fighting Against COVID-19. Now they are deploying people on social media to fight against all these uh, groups that are spreading misinformation. Back to you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, Skila, am I, have I answered to your question? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dalu. That was really interesting to hear about. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I the, the, the other one, the other lesson is that uh, we do not have to do research just for the sake of research, because uh, we as uh, researchers, we used to, we collect data and then we have, uh, uh, we have to publish, we publish and then we, we stop there. But politicians do not read our papers. That's so right. At That's some right. point, at some point, we need to translate all the results of our research in a, in a way that politicians and the gov and government have to take the opportunity of uh, this research to plan intervention that can help our population. And this is what we have been doing with uh, all these COVID-19 studies. We are going to the people that are on the field. We are going to the people who have uh, the, the power of taking decision and plan intervention to give them evidence on which, from which they can base their intervention and decision. And this, I think, is uh, something critical that we didn't have uh, the habitude to do that. Yeah, extremely critical. And I would say we're learning the same lesson in the US and really everywhere around the world um, in needing to better translate public health research into action that can be taken by policymakers and other important stakeholders to, to stop transmission and to uh, prevent infections and you know to get people vaccinated. So. I, I think that's true of DRC and, and almost everywhere that public health has had to adapt to be better at translating research, not just for publication, but for, for action. So that's that's been a really important lesson, I think, for all of us throughout this whole pandemic. Yeah, and as your presentation also showed, you know, the adaptability of that goes beyond just you know which topic we're researching and how that can best inform uh, other stakeholders like government, but also just to adapt existing research that's not about COVID at all to be able to collect information, uh, you know, coincidentally or at the same time about what's happening in in populations that are under study for other reasons and. You did a great job of this and the whole team uh, on the pharmacovigilance study in being able to shift you know, what was supposed to just be about understanding maternal vaccination and birth outcomes into understanding how this very sensitive population of pregnant women uh, mm -hmm. actually adheres to face mask use, and um, you know, whether there, any of these outcomes are changing uh between the pre and post COVID eras so that's been great yeah yeah so thank you so much Dalu. this was a wonderful talk i'm sorry thank we you. had some technical problems at the beginning but thank you for for bearing with us and for spending your time with us yeah thank you very much and thank you professor ani for this opportunity i will be available whenever you need me to, to share something with uh, the team this was a fantastic just presentation. I thought it was terrific. I thought that that it was so informative. It's so impressive. I'm so thrilled just to see 
the work that you're doing, the, the work that we're doing collaboratively. And I just could not be, I could not be happier um, with the outcome. So 